No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today, and I want to thank you for joining us. Let me tell you what we've got coming up in today's program. We'll begin with our devotional time as we do, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, a passage of great encouragement to keep running the Christian race. So please get out your Bibles, turn to Hebrews 12, and I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Roger Campbell will be with us for another of his Be Ready Always segments. Today he'll be dealing with the subject of our speech. Jim Dearman's in the studio and he's got some sound words for us today. He's going to tell us about someone who died learning. Then Cody Boston will be back in Cody's corner. He's got an earring with him today, and he's got a great illustration for us from that earring. In our final segment, Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin will repair our understanding about 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, a passage where God commands the Christian to judge certain people. Well, I hope that you have your Bibles open up to Hebrews chapter 12 so that we can read there together. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Sing to me, O heaven, sing their song of peace. From the toils that by me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted, never oppressing souls. Showers of great blessing, all my heart will flow. Sing to me, sing to me O heaven. We're looking today at the book of Hebrews. Back in chapter 11, we have what's been referred to as Faith's Hall of Fame. And this is a, a listing of Old Testament examples of people who believed and obeyed exactly what God asked them to do. Oftentimes, these things were done under very difficult circumstances. As a result, we can learn from them, Romans 15, verse 4. And our passage begins with that word, therefore, bringing all of that into the beginning of chapter 12, a text that we have for today. We need to imitate that quality that those people have. That is a true biblical faith. That idea of being so thoroughly convinced that it affects our actions. You see, faith is alive and not dead. A faith that works is alive, James 2, verse 17. So whatever God tells me to do, I'll do it. And that's the whole point there of chapter 11. So we get here into chapter 12, therefore, and the Hebrew writer uses an analogy of a long distance runner and equates Christianity to like running a marathon. 
Now, when you're running a marathon, uh, finishing is the main goal. You've accomplished something when you've run 26 miles. But to do that, the runners need a strategy. They know their bodies, they know what they can do, and they need a strategy on how they'll get there to that 26-mile mark. And like that strategy, like that approach, we as Christians need to lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. That idea of a weight, it would be kind of like a, a marathon runner carrying a cinder block. They're not going to get very far, and the little distance they get is going to be painful and difficult. But sin can drag a Christian down just like that cinder block. Our sin is a discouragement to us, and it can also be a discouragement to others. We need to continually seek to improve the way we live. That's a growing process. The Hebrew writer goes on in verse 4 to tell us, You have not yet resisted the bloodshed in your striving against sin. This is something we need to be fully committed to do. That's how we run this Christian race. The Christian isn't one who sees how close they can get to sin without crossing that line. No, the Christian is somebody who's repulsed by sin, realizing it's your greatest enemy. Consider what it took to remove that sin. Don't take that for granted. It is so easy, that sin that so easily ensnares us. It's easy to get caught up in it, but it is well worth our effort to fight it every chance we get. We also need to run with endurance. Keep going, keep pressing on. You know, nothing can separate us from God, but we can choose to separate ourselves from Him. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Paul tells the Romans, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor the things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. None of these external things can do it. Yet that same apostle Paul remained vigilant because he knew that he might have run the race in vain. His Christianity would have been worthless, Philippians 2 verse 16, if he didn't remain faithful. The only risk we have of losing our Christianity is if we give up and we stop trying. The Hebrew writer tells us that we need to consider our example, Jesus. He endured the cross and he despised the shame. I've gone through some difficulties in my life, not anything compared to what some others have gone through, and certainly nothing close to what Jesus has endured. But we can look to him and see everything that he went through to keep us away from sin. Am I putting forth any effort at all? He despised the shame of that sin. Do you despise that shame? Or are you trying to get as close as you can? And what motivated him? The joy that was set before him. What was that joy? It was our salvation, yours and mine. Don't allow that great sacrifice to be worthless. Keep pressing ahead to the joys of heaven. Be a child of God and stay there. And that is good news for us today. Now, Roger Campbell is ready as always to give us some great information from the scriptures. Today, he's helping us to guide our speech. Do you think God really cares about how we talk? Do our words mean something to God? Words are instruments that we use to communicate what's in our mind. I know there's something that we call body language, and in some specific instances, we can get a message across. But our main way of communicating is with words. I was a 16-year-old young man, and I attended a statewide gathering of athletes who identified themselves as being Christians. And in one of our break, breakout groups, about 15 or 20 of us were with two adult men. 
And those men said something that has stuck with me until this day. They told us, God doesn't care about how we talk. If you want to use dirty language, foul words, it doesn't mean, all that shows is you've got a limited vocabulary. You know, you tell a group of young people something like that, and chances are they're going to buy into it. When you and I open the scriptures and investigate, we find something that's very different. For instance, in the book of Matthew chapter 12, Jesus told those who were listening to him that you know a tree by its fruit, and you know a person's heart by the way he speaks. Matthew 12, 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Good heart, good things. Good heart, good words. Evil heart, evil things, evil words. Jesus went on to say, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And so, yes, God does care about our choice of words. In fact, according to verse 37, the Master said, our words could be the difference between our justification and our condemnation. We're going to be held accountable for the way that we speak. Well, sometimes in the Bible we read that God tells us there's certain language that He wants us to stay away from. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 25, we're told to put away lying and instead speak the truth with our neighbor. In that same chapter, Ephesians 4 and verse number 29, we're told let no filthy communication proceed out of thy mouth. God doesn't say just a little bit. God said, let there be none. And that idea there of corrupt or filthy communication is the idea of rottenness. Now on the positive side, we just learned from Ephesians 5 and verse 25, God wants us to use our tongues to speak the truth. And as we continue in Ephesians 4 and verse 29, we're to put away corrupt communication, but we're to speak those words which result in edification. Or we think about 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 18, where Paul had been writing about the resurrection from the dead and being reunited with the Lord Jesus. He said, comfort one another with these words. Or Hebrews 3 and verse 13, exhort one another daily. So yes, God wants us to use our tongues for good things, and avoid things that are wrong. God does care about our speech. I'm Roger Cannon, and this has been Be Ready Always. It's time now to grab some paper and something to write with so you can write down our contact information. If you haven't yet enrolled in our free Bible correspondence course, contact us and get started. Remember, all of our courses are, are given absolutely free of charge. We're not going to try to sell you anything, and we won't pester you with solicitations. After this brief break, Jim Dearman's going to be with us. Stay tuned. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1 877 384 7221. That's 1 877 384 7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. I hope you got down that contact information. If you didn't get it, you can get it from our website, gnttv.org. You can contact us for that free Bible correspondence course or just to ask us a Bible question you may have. 
Now, Jim Dearman's here in the studio, and he's going to be telling us about somebody who died while learning sound words. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. These words are on the grave of a scientist who died at the age of 95. He died learning. You know, it is so important to spend our lives learning from birth to the grave. However, we must be concerned about what we are learning. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote that it is possible to be ever learning and yet never being able to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. How tragic it is that men live their lives learning everything except that which is most important, the truth of God's Word. And those who are applying themselves to the study of truth in the Bible must also realize the importance of continual study and growth in the things that matter more than anything, spiritual truths. In 1 Peter 2, verse 2, Peter tells us we should desire the sincere or pure milk of the Word that we may grow thereby to maturity, maturity in Christ and to ultimate salvation in heaven. Be ever learning, but make certain what you are learning is eternal truth. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Thanks for those thoughts, Jim. We try to make our materials available to as many people as we can. You can see any of these segments or entire programs on our website, gnttv.org. Just click on the current and archive programs in the black banner at the top. You can also find us on Vimeo and YouTube. We have an app for your phone. Just go to the App Store and download it for free. We have a channel on Roku and Apple TV. You can watch us there. You can also hear Good News Today on Truth.fm, which is a group of internet radio stations that stream 24-7. Check it out. We also have two podcasts that are available wherever you get your podcast: Good News Today Daily Devotional Time and Good News Today Weekly. Now, Cody Boston is back in Cody's Corner, and today he's borrowed one of his wife's earrings as an illustration. Cody's Corner. Welcome to Cody's Corner. Uh, today I want to talk to you for a moment about earrings. I hope that uh, you can see the earring here. Uh, this is one of my wife's, so please don't tell her that I borrowed it. Uh, I'm just kidding. She knows. She already warned me not to lose it, so I'm going to put it back in here for now. But as you think of earrings, um, my mind goes to a song. That, uh, that I used to sing all the time as a teenager and always thought it was a very beautiful song. And maybe you have sung it uh, throughout your life and you might appreciate it as much as I do. And the song is called Pierce My Ear. And maybe in singing that song, you've wondered, what, is, what does that mean? What is, th does this song have meaning that maybe I don't understand or don't know? And what does it connect back to? Is there something it connects back to? So for our brief time together, I just wanted to talk about that song and the meaning uh, behind it and hope that it will uh, strengthen your faith and encourage you and bring new meaning to your life when you do something as simple as look at earrings or put in your earrings to start the day. But I want to read the lyrics first to the song. Pierce my ear, O Lord my God, take me to your door this day, for I will serve no other God, Lord. I'm here to stay. For you have paid the price for me. With your blood, you ransomed me. Now I will serve you eternally. Lord, I'm here to stay. And in the chorus, so pierce my ear, O Lord my God, take me to your door this day. For I will serve no other God. O Lord, I'm here to stay. Beautiful words to such a beautiful song. Open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 21 as we think of the meaning behind these words and why this song was written and what it can mean for us today. In Exodus chapter 21, picking up in verse 1. Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she has borne him his sons or daughters, the wife and her children 
shall be her master's, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Beautiful words to a beautiful song. Beautiful words to a beautiful scripture. And as you think of what we just read, some things to take away from it as you sing this song or think about the words. You have an instance where a servant has reached a point of service where now they are free. They can go out and live their life, and if they have family, they can take their family with them. However, they have an option to choose to stay and serve their master, to neglect the freedom, and in their freedom, choose servitude. What a powerful thought. And as I think of this song and I think of us now, for them then, it wasn't a choice of, well, I love you so much right now that for now, I will serve you continually. No, it tells us that they would choose to be a servant forever from that point forward for the rest of their earthly lives. And so for us, our commitment to Jesus is a commitment that is forever. It's something we make now. And so I want you to be reminded of that each and every day. When you wake up and you're getting ready to go out into the world, remember that you chose in your freedom, you chose service. So live out your life as a servant of His. May we every day say the words to God, pierce my ear. Well, that's it from my corner of the world. I hope you have a blessed day. What a great illustration to help us understand what true commitment really means. In just a moment, we'll be repairing our understanding with Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin from the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies after this brief break. Now Guyton and Troy repair our understanding about 1 Corinthians 5 verses 11 through 13, a passage where Scripture commands the Christian to judge other people. Let's repair our understanding of judging others together. All right, Troy, uh, have you ever had uh, asked a question in Bible class or in a setting and somebody says, well, it means what it says and says what it means? <laughs> I have indeed. In fact, that's one of the principles of the Restoration movement, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible's silent. Yeah, well, that's the answer that kind of came to my mind when I, I read what was sent to us on this. It says, please explain 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13. <laughs> okay. and, and I like it, though, because, um, you know, at, at surface value, well, it means what it says. But the the challenge we have in repairing our understanding so much of the time is is exactly what does it mean? How do we apply this? That's the, That's the important part. And so, as always, we've got to keep it in context. Let me read this. Um, but now I have written unto you to, um, not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one, know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judge it. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Now, let's understand, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he's dealing with a situation. As I think last week, we talked about the whole book of Corinthians deals with what? A lot of problems. They had lots of problems in the church in Corinth. And this one in particular was a man that was with his 
father's wife and committing fornication. If you don't understand that, email Troy Spradlin, and he'll explain <laughs> it to you in greater depth. Well, this all has to do with church discipline. I mean, this is really what Paul's dealing with, and it's a subject that's touchy and that people don't like, but it's a subject that is throughout the scriptures. And what do you do, like in this context, with an individual that will not repent for the one that doesn't understand what church discipline is? Well, in this case, you put them out. In fact, this is not the only time that this is brought up. Ephesians chapter five, verse 11 says, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 18 taught how we're supposed to go to the brother. And if he won't listen, well, then you have to practice church discipline over and over. You see this in second Thessalonians chapter uh, three, verse six, that you're supposed to withdraw from those who walk disorderly. Uh, God does not like division. He doesn't like anything that goes against uh, the scriptures, especially things like false teaching and blatant sin. And that's what we're dealing with here. First Timothy chapter one, verse 20, Paul would write of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so it kind of gives us this, this understanding of what is the mm-hmm. purpose of church discipline. There you go. You know, we could talk about this for, you know, hours on end, but it's, you know, what do we do with the one that will not repent that allows sin to exist and they are a part of the church? Well, then you've got to deal with that individual. Uh, Paul describes it as delivering unto Satan, but it's for what purpose? I think there's two purposes in church discipline. One, to try and help the individual that's in sin so that they'll come out of it. Exactly. Like in James chapter five, verse 20, that says, let him know that he who turns a sinner from error of his way will save a soul from death. That's, that's one of the key purposes. And what was the second one you were going to give? Well, I was going to say the second one is that we protect the congregation. Exactly. Because the principles given by Jesus that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And so we don't want to bring sin into the camp, so to speak, to use an old Testament Mm -hmm. reference. We want to keep the purity, the holiness of the church. And so rather than to allow it to spread throughout, to protect the holy, sometimes you have to deliver one to Satan to not keep company with them. Amen. Something else that we've been commanded to judge is the teaching that you hear. Compare these things to the Word of God and see if they're not so. If you'd like to hear any of these segments or the entire program again, You can find it on our app's website or even on the podcast. We try to make things available so you can check these things against the scriptures as much as you'd like. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us for a free course or if you have a Bible question you'd like to answer. Thanks so much for being with us. See you again next time. Good news, there is good news today. All around the world. Good news, good news around the world. Always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.